you guys again for helping uh, you know, for helping me to to be here um, to come and talk to you uh, about Chosen People Ministries and about this wonderful wonderful season. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is uh, Neil Sarasky. I am a rabbi because I am the leader of a Messianic Jewish congregation uh, in Northern Virginia. Yes, I said Messianic Jewish congregation. That means that I, like you, believe that Jesus is the promised Messiah who came in fulfillment uh, to die for our sins, who defeated death so that we might have life and life everlasting. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, I do represent Chosen People Ministries. We are the longest consecutively running mission to the Jewish people in existence. Beginning in January of this coming year, we will be in our 125th year of ministry, bringing the gospel to the Jewish people and teaching the church how to do the same. So it's an incredible time. It's an incredible season for us, and I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Uh, my wife could not be here. She was taking care of our grandchildren last night and so was extremely tired this morning and was still asleep when I left the house. But she does. She just wanted me to send you her greeting, so thank you for that. Um, Chosen People Ministries, as I mentioned, is responsible for bringing the gospel to the Jewish people. Uh, it started by a rabbi named Leopold Cohen in the uh, late 19th century. Uh, that's 1894, for those of you who are counting. And... Um, it's an incredible opportunity uh, that he saw. He was studying the Old Testament, what we call in Judaism the Tanakh. Okay? And in it, lo and behold, he came across some prophecies that looked very much like it was talking about somebody he had heard of that he had been told he was not allowed to believe in, this guy named Jesus. He came to believe that Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies, was the promised Messiah. He told his friends, and they didn't like it very much. So they said, you know what? You should go to America. That's what he did. And lo and behold, in Brooklyn, which is where he came in, he found his brothers and sisters, his Jewish brothers and sisters. Paul would call them the kinsmen of the flesh. And he said, you know what? These guys, they need to know about Jesus too. So they started handing out tracts, and the, the Brownsville mission to the Jews was born. It grew. It became the Williamsburg mission to the Jews. That became the American Board of Missions to the Jews. And in eight, 1983, we changed our name to Chosen People Ministries because missions just isn't appealing to Jewish people. It was more of a turn and we don't want to be a stumbling block, which is what the scripture said. So we changed our name to be more appealing uh, and acceptable to Jewish people. And so here we are today. We are in, um, right now, 17 countries. And we have uh, more than 150 missionaries uh, across the world bringing the gospel to the Jewish people. And it's a work like, like never before. We're seeing Jewish people return to the land. Another fulfillment of prophecy, by the way. And more and more Jewish people are coming to faith now than ever before. You want to talk about the song that we just sang. It says, you want to hear the dry bones singing. That's what Ezekiel is talking about, guys. You know, when the Jewish people return to their land and return to the faith of Abraham, their father. So this is all happening in our lifetime. And what an amazing thing it is. And at the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you an opportunity to partner with Chosen People Ministries. Before we do that, though, I want to share a little bit with you about what the Lord has been, uh, been speaking to me about this season. You know, right now we're in Hanukkah, or I should say, for those of you who are, are novices, Hanukkah. Okay? And, and each night we light the lights. And, you know, for those of us who believe in Jesus as Messiah, we remember that he is the light of the world who came into the world you know, at the, during, you know, during this season. And now, because he lives in us, we are the lights of the world, shining his light through us to those who need to know him. This is an amazing thing that we get to do as Messianic believers that the Jewish people aren't doing right now. Tonight, uh, when they light that last, that last candle, they don't get anything else until next year in March when they start to celebrate Purim. We, though have an added, an added bonus right now. Because we are not just focusing on the light of the world um, and what he has done for us. We're focusing now on his birth. How many of you, and this is by a show of hands, actually, you know what? I just want you to think about this because I don't want to embarrass anybody. 
I, I see the wide variety of ages in this room. Um, some of you might remember records. <laughs> May, maybe. And for those of you who don't, maybe cassettes. Remember cassettes? Okay. Well, records and cassettes had two sides. Remember that? When you got to the end of one, you actually had to get up, walk over to either your cassette player or your, your record player, turn it over, and start again from the beginning of side two. And as I was sitting here thinking about this, we have such an amazing God. We, and and um, the, the worship leader this morning said, God has sent his son to be the sacrifice for our sins. And that's absolutely true. 90% of the time, we focus on side B. We focus on the fact that he died for our sins. But there's a side A. And it's two words. In that sentence, it's just two words. God sent. He had to be sent before he could do the finished work on the cross. And I was thinking about this, and as I was talking with, with, with um, Pastor John about what to speak about today, in, in light of the season, I sort of thought we would talk about his birth, that side A part of it. And as believers, we have to focus on this as well. We only focus on it once a year. Really, when you think about it, at Christmas time. But if he hadn't been sent, he couldn't do the work. You can't have one without the other. So when we think about the atonement uh, of our sins on the cross, we need to think about the miracle of his birth at the same time. It's all one package. For Jewish people, it becomes even more significant. And I'm going to give you a little key into Jewish evangelism. You believe in evangelism, right? What, what is evangelism? It's bearing witness. It's preaching the gospel to those who need to hear it. It's sharing your testimony. It's sharing the truth of scripture. It's bringing about the reality of who Messiah Jesus is and who we are in relationship to him and the need for that relationship. So we are all evangelists at different levels of training. We are called. Matthew calls, Jesus calls us to it at the end of the book of Matthew. Go then, proclaiming the gospel and baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're all evangelists, all called to do this. I want to give you a couple of tips today on how to do this for Jewish people. Now, who is the very best Jewish evangelist you ever knew or heard of? What'd you think? Jesus? After Jesus? Paul? Paul was the apostle to the who? He was the apostle to the Gentiles. Okay? So it's not Paul. All right. There's three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, and every one of them has an agenda, has a reason for writing, right? Okay? There's a reason you write a book. Each one of the three Synoptics, Ma Matthew, Mark, and Luke, okay, have a reason. Luke was the academia. Uh, guy. He was the one who said, I'm just documenting everything I can. I want to get it down. I want to get it straight. That's my agenda. Mark was writing to Gentiles. We know this by the way he writes his gospel. He has to explain stuff that the Jewish people would never need to be, un be explained. There's one more gospel. The gospel of Matthew. Matthew is the consummate Jewish evangelist. Okay? He started with a story about Messiah's birth, and most people think that it was because that's usually the best place to, best, best place to start at the beginning, right? Let's start at the very beginning, a very good place, right? There's so much more significance to it. Matthew is writing to Jewish people. He is... He is living out, before Paul ever came, the heart of Paul, who at the very beginning of Romans chapter 10 says, 
Brothers, my heart's desire is that they, Israel, be saved. Matthew is living that out. He's writing to the Jewish people for that express purpose. Now, why is he the consummate Jewish evangelist? Because he knew exactly what Jewish people needed in order to come to faith, in order to believe what was happening. He knew exactly what they needed. How did he know? How did he know? Because he was. He was Jewish. So he knew exactly what they needed. Um, have you ever heard the phrase, uh, seeing is believing? So seeing is believing was a quote by Thomas Fuller, uh, an, a, a writer in the, in the mid-18th century. That's only actually the first part of the saying. But the reality is this. Most Jewish people, and Matthew knew this because he was one, and I are one. They need that. Okay? In Christianese, we would say that that's looking for signs and wonders. And signs and wonders are great. Because they're easy to see. And Jewish people, we like to see those kinds of things. Okay? This was really important. What I mean by this is that the Jewish people were given the entire Old Testament. Filled with prophecy filled with explanations, filled with anticipation of what was yet to come, a Messiah who would come for them, who would restore them to independence, who would restore them to freedom. And it's all in prophecy. What they were looking for was the fulfillment of prophecy. And we're all sort of looking for that today, right? We want to see that. We want to see it today. We want to see it right now. Let's see it. Let's see it come to pass. The Jewish people, they were looking for the fulfillment of prophecy. So Matthew, the consummate Jewish evangelist, gave it to him. Gave it to him. When you read the Gospel of Matthew, there is no other uh, Gospel writer who uses as many quotations from the Old Testament as Matthew does. Why? Because he's proving to the Jewish people that Jesus is the promised Messiah. He is the one who will come and atone for the sins of Israel. But it had to start somewhere. Now, if you are going to start and talk about um, prophecy and how Jesus fulfilled those prophecies, where would you start? Good question. Uh, I don't know. Uh, well, and you turn it back to, well, where would you start? Or where would you tell me to start? So maybe, all right, all right, I, got, I get it, Rabbi, I get it. We'll talk about the birth. Let's talk about the birth. It's a good place. It's the beginning. Um, let's say, what about the virgin birth? Should we do that? Should we talk about that? Yeah, well, that's probably a good place, a good thing to talk about. Um, what about, and think about prophecy, 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 birth, prophecy. How about Bethlehem? We can talk about Bethlehem. Matthew does. He talks about them. He doesn't start with them. He talks about the virgin birth. The virgin birth was the second thing that Matthew talks about. Okay, In, in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Okay, starting at 18. 18 through 25. That's eight verses. Okay, Talks about the virgin birth. Okay. The story doesn't mean anything without the prophecy. Okay? God is a God of miracles. Throughout history, God has allowed barren women to give birth. <laughs> he's, brought, he's allowed dead people to get up. Okay? He's a God of miracles. What makes this very special is that there was a prophecy a long, long time ago about just this event. Remember, the Jewish people are looking for the fulfillment of the prophecy. And this prophecy comes in Isaiah chapter 7 in verse 14. It says, a young woman, a virgin, shall be with child. And they will call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, it's an amazing 
name. What does it mean? God with us. Did you know in Hebrew, it, it's, a little, it's a little backwards the way we, we talk? It's almost like Yoda. It's not God with us. It's with us, God. Mm. <laughs> Imanu. With us is God. That's who this child was going to be. God. Now, Isaiah has so much more to say on this. In fact, we sang it a little bit. For to us, a son is given. Unto us, a son shall be born, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And he goes on to say, And his name shall be called Pele Yoes, wonderful counselor. A baby. Baby. Bambino. El Gibor. Mighty God. Aviad. Everlasting Father. Sar Shalom. The Prince of peace in one child the Godhead this is the baby that we're referring to this is the baby that Matthew is saying this virgin shall conceive and bear a son and his name will be Emmanuel and the government will be upon his shoulders and he will be God from the beginning to the everlasting from eternity was his comings and goings, is what the scripture says. Matthew is showing the Jewish people that this baby is the son of God, made manifest for us. If this were not the case, then all the rest of what he's going to talk about makes no difference, because he's unqualified to be the Messiah. So he starts with this concept of the virgin, he, actually that's not true, he doesn't start with it, this is the second thing he does. As important as all of this is, you think, this is not the first thing, this is not primary in Matthew's mind, it's secondary. Tertiary to that is Bethlehem. He talks about Bethlehem, the first 11 verses of chapter 2 is all about Bethlehem, and this is where we get you know, some of our Christmas carols from. O little town of Bethlehem. You know, all this kind of, and about the star? What an incredibly beautiful prophecy. But it doesn't mean anything unless there's an Old Testament prophecy to go along with it. Remember what Matthew's focus is supposed to be. He's bringing the gospel to the Jewish people. He's telling the Jewish people that this Jesus, born in a manger is the Son of God, the one that was prophesied by our prophets. This is what we have been waiting for. In Micah chapter 5 in verse 2 uh, is where this, 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 uh, this prophecy comes from, where he says, but you, Bethlehem, this is Matthew chapter 2 and verse 6, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler. This is Matthew, quoting from Micah, who will shepherd my people, Israel. You ever hear the, I mean, there's lots of different names for God. You ever hear of a, you know, Jehovah Roe? Adonai, that, that in Hebrew, it's Adonai Roe. God is shepherd. Out of Bethlehem will come the ruler of Israel. The one who will shepherd the Jewish people. Matthew is saying that this is that baby. The reason he was born in Bethlehem, might, you might even just think, well, that's just coincidence. I preach 
anti-coincidental theology. What does that mean? There ain't no coincidence in God. Where were Mary and Joseph living? In Nazareth, Nazareth, which is north. It's in the region of the Galilee. But because there had been called a census, you have to go back to the land of your fathers. And Joseph was from the tribe of Thought I heard it. Nope. Joseph was from the tribe of Judah. He's from the tribe of Judah. And Judah had to be south. And so they went and they registered their census numbers in Bethlehem. By the way, that is why there weren't no room at the inn. Because everybody who had to go and register for the census was going back there. And so when Joseph and Mary go to register, there's no room left. And so they end up in a manger. So Matthew has talked about this virgin birth, which was not primary in his mind. He's talked about the prophecy of, be, of the baby being born in Bethlehem, also not primary in his mind. What was primary in his mind? So eight verses at the end of chapter one are dedicated to the virgin birth. 11 verses at the beginning of chapter 2 are dedicated to the prophecy fulfillment of the baby being born in Bethlehem. What are we missing? Yeah. Did, you, did anybody hear what she said? The genealogy. The very first thing Matthew does and what takes more verses than either of these other things we've been talking about is the genealogy. Now, why on earth would that be? Why does Matthew talk about the genealogy first? That the Messiah, the one who would take away the sins of the world, was Jewish. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Jewish people. The prophecies are all talking about a Jewish person who would be the Messiah. If the person who is born is not Jewish and from the tribe of Judah and a descendant of David the king, this cannot be the king of Israel. This cannot be the promised Messiah. And so the very first thing that, that, that Matthew does is he establishes the credibility of the Messiah by bringing about his genealogy. And he starts it this way. Verse 1 from the very beginning. Now, it's, it's really interesting to note how Matthew starts this. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's his thesis. That's his opening argument. This is the Christ, the son of David, a Jewish guy. Son of, you know, son of David, son of Abraham. And then he offers the proof. In the next 16 verses, he starts with Abraham. And he traces Jesus' lineage all the way through. All the way through. And he goes from Abraham all the way to David. Abraham, and that, that includes Judah. All the way down, through the captivity, all the way to Joseph, to Jesus. Now, this is so significant that Matthew started with this. This is... And everything else comes out of this. Once he proves that Messiah was Jewish and from the tribe of Judah, 
and he's in the tribe of David, now he has the ability to say, okay, he is imminently qualified. Let me show you why he is who he says he is. So why does he have to be Jewish? Well, all of the prophecies refer to the fact that this Messiah would be from Israel. He would be from Judah. I mean, that, there's not, nothing more you really need to say. He's going to be a Jewish man. He has to be from the tribe of Judah. Right? Because Judah produces David. David is the kingly line. And this would be the king of Israel. Now, we know that Joseph was from the tribe of Judah of the line of David. That qualifies him to be king. I want to show you something else that's not actually in, uh, in Matthew. I find it interesting that it's not, but we read about it more in Luke. What does the book of Hebrews say about Messiah? That he is our high priest. Okay, so now we might have a problem. Do you remember? And this is going back to your Old Testament, okay? What tribe did the priests come from? Levi. So in order for this person to be both king and priest, and how, how do you do that? So let's look at Luke. Let's talk about Luke. Luke is just getting the facts. He's, he's, his agenda is to not have an agenda. Okay? He starts out by talking about Elizabeth and her husband, whose name was what? Zechariah. Okay? What did Zechariah do for a living? What was his job? He was a priest. Now, priests were not allowed to marry outside of their tribe. So Zechariah married Elizabeth, which means that Elizabeth was from what tribe? Levi. Who do we know was a relative of Elizabeth? Mary. What tribe was Mary from? So Jesus' father on the earth was of the tribe of Judah, which qualified him to be king. And his earthly mother was from the tribe of Levi, which qualifies him to be priest. That, by the way, is the only way this works. He is our high priest. He is our king, and it's because of the prophecies that were fulfilled in his birth. And Matthew is laying all of this out for the Jewish people. Before I came to faith, and I'm just getting started, by the way. I, I mean, Pastor John gave me the full two hours, so we're, we're just going <laughs> to... Kidding. Almost done. Just want to bring this home. Look, prophecy is the kind of thing that you can continue to dig into for a really long time. I am just skimming the surface surface to, to stimulate something in you that says, you know what, that's really cool. I should look more at that. As you look more at that, you will find more, and then you will find more to find. That's the nature of prophecy. So I'm just gonna, here to tickle your ears a little bit and get you to think a little bit and to get you to think about the idea of Jewish evangelism and how to, during this season, share your faith, the truth of the gospel of Jesus with the Jewish people that you know in your life. Before I came to faith, the one thing that I knew 
was that I was not allowed, not allowed to believe in Jesus. I was raised in a Jewish home. Celebrated Passover because it was a great time for food and family. Celebrated Christmas, too. Because it was the birth of a great Jewish man. My dad. It's his birthday. That's the only reason why we celebrated it in our house. Okay? So, you know, we had a Christmas tree. <laughs> you know, my uncle Artie came over every year. Um, we, we, had, we, we stored up all of our Hanukkah presents and stuck, stuck them under the tree, which we called, it was, it was actually, this is really, really nice. My parents always had a bigger, bigger tree. Um, and we stuck out, we didn't call it a Christmas tree. No, 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 no. Can't be a Christmas tree. Hanukkah bush. And we took all of our Hanukkah presents and put them under the Hanukkah bush so that my Uncle Artie, on my father's birthday, Christmas Day, could come over with all the rest of our family and hand out presents to all the kids. But you're not allowed to believe in Jesus and still be Jewish. So before I came to faith, that was the one thing that I knew, was that I couldn't believe in Jesus and be Jewish. Now, in the process of my coming to faith, which was a 10-year a journey, in reality, during that process, the hardest obstacle to overcome was how to reconcile being Jewish and being a believer. That was, that was, that was it for me. The final straw in my coming to faith. It's like you've got this piece of this big puzzle. And everything fits but this one piece. The piece that I couldn't make fit was being Jewish and being a believer. As soon as I realized that there was nothing to reconcile, that being Jewish and being a believer in this Jewish Messiah was absolutely, positively continuous, continuous, contiguous, whatever word you want to use, it all made sense. There's nothing to reconcile. That peace fell into place, and my life has never been the same since. I'm Jewish. So is Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's what the ministry of Chosen People Ministries is fit to do, is to bring that message to the Jewish people in a Jewish way, just like Matthew did, so that they can understand and see finally for themselves that Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, is the one promised for them as well as the rest of the world. Romans 1.16, pastor quoted earlier, is you know, Paul is talking about the fact that the gospel is for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Gentile, however you want to phrase it. But it's for the Jew first. And so we want to offer you the ability to sow into that ministry. Is presenting the gospel to the Jewish people in this form, this manner, something you would invest in? Maybe. I want you to give you that opportunity, though. You have this slip in your brochure or in your, in your bulletin. Go ahead and pull them out. Open that up once. If you don't have it, we'll make sure you get one. On the inside is a beautiful, and I couldn't do this if my wife was here because she would yell at me, is a beautiful color picture of my wife and myself. Thank you, Photoshop. <laughs> for me, for me. She looks just like that. That is our gift for you for you, for coming today. When you go home, carefully take your best coupon clipping scissors and clip that picture out. Okay? You're laughing. I, I've done this so many times for, you know, for so many years that uh, I actually go back to places and they have our picture on their refrigerator. 
So clip that out. Put it on your refrigerator. That way you'll remember to come down. You know, you'll, you'll go for your milk for your cereal or your milk for your coffee or juice or whatever on your refrigerator. You'll see it. You say, oh, I have to pray for Neil and Kim Sarasky today. Why do we do that? Well, a Jewish bro another Jewish you know, brother of mine, his name was Yaakov, uh, call him James, he wrote a book of the Bible. And in that book, he says that the effective, fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Do you believe that? Obviously, you do. You wouldn't have been praying this morning. Well, we believe that the, if the effective, fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much, then the effective, fervent prayers of many righteous men and women, that's y'all, or you guys if you're in New York or Jersey or whatever, um, that's you guys, that, it, that it's even more effective. So we want you to covenant with us, to partner with us, to pray. Pray for the work of Neil and Kim Sarasky within Chosen People Ministries. Pray that the gospel will go forth to the Jewish people and also to the Greek. Now, what is my role in Chosen People Ministries? I have a really fascinating role. It's a new role for me based, you know, that we picked up in July. I have become the director of publications for Chosen People Ministries. So that means that every month, where I used to come out and do things like, like this, and I love doing this. That's why I'm still here. I get to meet 20, 30, 40 people at a time through what God has allowed me to do now. Through the Chosen People Ministries newsletters and president's letters and other prayer letters, I get to reach and bring this message to 100,000 Jewish people every month. That is so humbling to me, but I can't do it without your help, without your prayers, and without your support. If you open that up one more time, there's a place for you to put your name, your address, your phone number, and an offering. Your financial support means the world to us. Remember, you're not sowing into one person per se. You're sowing into presenting the gospel to Jewish people all over the country and all over the world. If that's worth investing in to you, consider what the Lord would have you give today. But I want to I want to just close with this one last thing. Even if you're not being led to give financially, please fill that slip out. Drop that into the offering plate uh, or the basket. Let that be your offering. Because your prayers are will go up like a fragrant incense to the nostrils of the of the Lord. And you'll get the opportunity to receive our prayer letter every month. So you will know how to pray for the ministry. Uh, and we really appreciate that.